Grace and peace, everybody. Welcome to Berean TV. I want to share a little bit about these um, black Gnostics. I want to explain some stuff. Um, if you're dealing with Gnosticism, you have to go back to this gentleman, Muhammad Ali. It all starts with Muhammad Ali in Egypt. Muhammad Ali was out looking for some fertilizer. He was in a cave near what's called Nag Hammadi. He went in the cave, he found two jars. Inside the jars, he opened them up and he found about 13 codexes. Those would be books. He found 13 leather-bound books, and that would be what some would consider one of the greatest finds in the 20th century. Those Gnostic Gospels, or what we would call Nag Hammadi, or what some people would consider the Lost Gospels, They've been on um, the center of a lot of controversy, a lot of conspiracy. And I just want to kind of show a connection with these lost gospels. A lot of people don't understand um, the Da Vinci Code, a lot of conspiracy stuff that's floating around the internet. When we start dealing with um, missing books of the Bible, you'll often hear people and they can't distinguish between what's considered Nag Hammadi or what's considered Gnostic Gospels and the lost books of the Bible and the forgotten books of Eden, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and what we call the regular canonical Gospels. The first thing I'd like to do is bring out people. When you're talking about the um, lost Gospels or Nag Hammadi collection, you have to deal with people such as Mrs. Elaine Pagels here. She's from Princeton University and she She's definite. She have a few books out there, but this is one of her um, most popular books. I think I have all, I think I have two or three of her books, The Origin of Satan, and then she have another one, Adam, Eve, and the Serpent. Elaine is interesting in that she gives a different perspective. I'm going to speak about two people, but she gives a different perspective on what a lot of mainstream scholars feel concerning the Gnostic Gospels. Most scholars from the most liberal to conservative, most scholars understand that these Gospels came about in the 2nd and 3rd century. They were later works. That's one of the problems that a lot of believers have when dealing with other people. Other people like to talk about um, lost gospels and missing gospels, and you'll hear Phil Valentine and different people. They had so many gospels that they had to pick from. And like everything was on the table at the Nicene Council and a bunch of other stuff. But I'm going to get into that. The Gnostic discovery. You're going to deal with Elaine Pagels from Princeton. You're going to deal with this guy, Marvin Myers, and um, one other person I'm going to show you. These are just um, some of the works that I have that I find the most important for people in their fields. If you're on in their field, if you're on YouTube, if you're on the Internet, you can look up on Bible Fact Ministries. This is a ministry started by Ken Johnson. Ken Johnson has a degree in the field. He have a lot of books out there. One that he have recently dropped is Demonic Gospels, dealing with the um, those lost gospels, as people would call them, or what we would just simply call the Nag Hammadi um, writings or the Gnostic Gospels on ancient post-flood history, ancient paganism. He have some good stuff. Hopefully, if y'all on YouTube, y'all are familiar with Mike Kaiser, his work, Unseen Realm, Zachariah Stitching is Wrong. He have a website dealing with that. Mike Kaiser has a multiple videos speaking on Gnostic texts and the differences with Gnostic texts. The people that I'm showing you, this is their specific field. It's good to know people in the field and what they do and, and what they teach their specific area. I often talk about that. Well, I want to show share a couple of things that the Gnostics believe because they were totally different from what we would call orthodoxy. And I'm going to bring up some, some things with that. They don't really believe that you needed clergy, that we had a, a tiered systems, that we had bishops later on after the apostle died, that we had bishops and priests and deacons, which were leaders in the church or what we would call in Ephesians for a five-fold ministry and things of that nature. They believe that you can just come to a, a from an intuition, from an esoteric inner witness, you can come to a knowledge of, of God and you didn't really need um, a priest to lead you, a priest to teach you because you can know within yourself. 
we're seeing a lot of that on a rise right now, especially in light of so much scandal and people leaving the church. A lot of people saying, I don't need no preacher. I don't need no teacher. I just, I just go with what feels right on the inside. And it's basically a heart theology. Um, Jesus didn't come to teach us um, Jesus did not come to be a savior for the world. This is something that Gnostics teach. Gnostics teach that um, Jesus came us to teach us Christ consciousness, that we're all Christ. We all have Christ inside of us. We all have that ability, but we just have to understand it. God is not the most high God. The God of the Old Testament is not the most high God, but he's a lesser God. This is why places like Isaiah, you see, he's a jealous God. They teach things like that, and they believe that Jesus came to teach the great true God. And, and how the great true God wanted to free people. And we'll talk about people like Marcion later on who believe that the Old Testament God is different. And there's a lot of people believe in that right now. And there's a, a female principle. We'll talk about um, the gospel to the Egyptians and different gospels dealing with that. And they all use Christian lingo. That's the, that's the crazy thing that Gnostics, what we call Gnostics, they didn't call themselves Gnostics back in the days. These people actually considered themselves Christians. They considered themselves believers, but the church fathers said even though that they would use cert certain terminology and they look like Christians, that they weren't actually Christians. Some people today may call them modern New Agers. So the term Gnosticism or Gnostics, they're actually a new that's actually a new term that we coined on a group of people back in the days. They did not call themselves Gnostics. Now, when we start talking about black Gnostics, some of the most popular ones that's on the internet now, are Bobby Hemet, Phil Valentine, Brother Panic, Dr. York, y'all know he's locked up young Pharaoh, and some teachings from Clarence 13 X who founded the Nation of Islam. I mean, the nation of gods and earths. When we deal with the conscious community, Gnosticism is prevalent. Gnosticism or, or Gnostic theology is prevalent throughout the conscious community. It may come in different forms, but it's prevalent. Um, I basically gave y'all a rundown on Nag Hammadi. So when you hear people say the lost books of the Bible, the missing books of the Bible, and all of that stuff, oftentimes they don't understand that they're talking about the Nag Hammadi collection, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Philip, Mary Magdalene, Gospel of Truth, and all these, and a lot of, not all of them, but a lot of other Gospels that were found by, in 1945, by that gentleman, Muhammad Ali. If you're going to get them, the one on the left, um, everybody that's dealing with Gnosticism, I basically, I would believe, have these scriptures or um, downloaded it from the PDF. The one on the right speaks about Nag Hammadi as well as the Dead Sea Scrolls, explaining a little bit about the differences. And it's good to know the difference when you're dealing with um, various people. This is an actual picture of the leather-bound um, codices and... Muhammad Ali said from his own testimony that when he got him, he didn't know what they was. He took them home and he put them in a the corner and his mother burned a lot of them for, you know, just to heat, just to heat the house up. She, you know, threw a lot of them in the fire and, and that's basically how the story goes. But I'm going to get into some of the, I'm going to get into some of the people, some of the things that they taught, teach and how we have that Nag Hammadi collect connection and people don't know it's moving in the african-american community it's moving on the internet and in social media it's moving around um far as a part of a conspiracy theory and i'm going to make a connection with another scholar and where some people will get this from because we'll watch certain movies and we'll hear certain things and it's it's all really a connection. It's an esoteric connection. It's a Masonic connection. It's all what we would call occult lore. It's occult doctrine that's taught from the beginning that man be can become God and man can become God and the church is attempting to suppress man. A lot of people feel they gave us at least once a week, I would get something Berean. They gave us a watered down version. They trying to point us to this white Jesus. We're all Christ. The original Bible don't read that way. And I ask people, well, where's the original Bible? Talk to me about the original Bible manuscripts and where can some of this stuff have, you know, come from? Give 
give me the rundown, give me the explanation of it, and a lot of people can. I just want to talk about two groups. Valentinianism was one of those major groups, um, Christian groups, and that was founded by Valentinius, and that's a second century on Christian group now. It was spread all over the place. Some people argue that this is the um, belief system, this is the Gnostic group that looked more closely to orthodoxy than any other group that was around. And the different church fathers were actually upset that um, people couldn't tell the difference. Now, there was another guy that is important to talk about, and his name is Marcion. Now, Marcion is, some people would say he's not a Gnostic per se, but he's one of those people that did believe the God of the Old Testament was a mean, spiteful, vengeful God and was not the God of Jesus Christ, the God that sent Jesus Christ to teach us this, what some would call Christ consciousness. He didn't um, believe in all of the apostles, but he believed that that the true apostle from God was the apostle Paul. So he acknowledged some of the Pauline epistles. He didn't really want to acknowledge everything else in orthodoxy. And it's so crazy that he is one of the first ones to form what we would basically call the Christian canon speaking on certain books that were accepted. And because there were so many books in circulation, different people, you know, that kind of forced the church, that kind of forced the church into speeding up or making a list or what we were, what some people would call actually having a canon because, you know, a canon is how we, um, or how we measure our faith. A canon is the rule of faith. We have four canonical gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you hear of any other gospels, those are considered non-canonical gospels. Um, Ebionites, so Ebionism was a false view of the nature of Christ that arose in the second century. Ebionites denied Jesus' divinity and believed that Jesus was the Son of God only by virtue of being adopted by God. Um, some people believe this was a continuation of um, Judaizers back in the days. There are some um, camps that, Israelite camps that hold to this and other strange teachings that shrinkled all the way down. I'm not going to go through everything on the slide, but just key things that I want to bring out. Now, I'm going to show you a list of the books from the lost books of the Bible and the forgotten books of Eden. And I want to make sure y'all understand that there's a separation between those books and what was actually found in what we would call Nag Hammadi Gospels, the Gospel of Truth. And this is how it opens up. This is one of Nag Hammadi Gospels. The Gospel of Truth is joy to those who have received from the Father the truth, the gift of knowing him by the power of the Logos. They were heavy into the Logos. And if anyone understands the canonical gospel of John, John says in the beginning was the word. And that word, that Logos, is, they believe was the teacher. That um, Some people argue that that comes from Greek thought. Let me just go ahead. Um, the Gospel of Truth does not contain any firsthand accounts of Jesus' life, such as we find in the New Testament Gospels. It's not saying that they were there and give narration like the canonical Gospels, but a lot of these Gospels just drop wisdom. When we start dealing with the... Um, well, let me read this first. The New Testament gives us eyewitness accounts of the life and the teachings of Jesus. The gospel of truth gives us esoteric and mystical teachings about God and the world. Much of it is difficult to make sense of. And the reason of that is because many people believe you had to be initiated into the teachings because we say it was esoteric. You had to understand certain things in order to understand store, the stories that were laid out. This is how come you would often meet people and they would tell you, man, the Gospels are allegory. You got to understand their allegory because a lot of things that were written in Nag Hammadi and later Gospels from the second, third, and fourth century, those Gospels that were written, they were written more in an esoteric form. So people would consider those giving a message allegorically. Now, when we start dealing with... um. When we start dealing with the Gospels, we have the Gospel of Thomas and Philip. D and Philip. These were bound together. They were basically bound together from my understanding in one codex. And a lot of people 
um, tend to often talk about the Gospel of Thomas, and I want to explain a little bit of that, that the Gospel of Thomas is what we would call the superstar of Nag Hammadi. That's the most popular one. That's made up with about 114 different sayings. Now, in all actuality, we do have scholars that would place the Gospel of Thomas to be one of the first, closer to the first century, early second century. So among everything found in Nag Hammadi, a lot of attention has been paid to the Gospel of Thomas. It's made up of 114 sayings. And it's and it's different a little bit in the sense that it's nothing but just sayings here and there, like Proverbs. It'll be a, a one one verse will say would give you one saying, another one will be another saying, and it's no narration at all. Just why sayings and people would take bits and pieces of those things and say these are the jewels that Jesus dropped, and these are the most important things that people need to understand, and these are the important most important things that Jesus need that you need to learn that came down from Jesus, the one that was teaching us all to be the Christ. It was written in the Coptic language and it's based in the, to, um, to approximately the fourth century. The Gospel of Philip, now we're talking about, is a Gnostic gospel presenting a Gnostic viewpoint of Jesus and his teachings. While there are few verses in the Gospel of Philip that resemble the four biblical Gospels, a reading of the Gospel of Philip will reveal many irreconcilable differences and a completely different message regarding who Jesus is and what he came to do. Remember, so many people are out here teaching a whole bunch of different stuff, and a lot of believers don't understand where it comes from. When you deal with the Gospel of Philip, this isn't an actual um, copy of it, but when you deal with that, the portion portions of the Gospel of Philip, there are holes in the manuscript. And we have people like Dan Brown that wrote in his book that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene because in the Gospel of Philip, it said that Jesus took her and he would often kiss her on the, and then it's a hole in the manuscript. And scholars would say, we don't know what it say. We don't know. He kissed her on the forehead, kissed her on the cheek, kissed her on the lips. But Dan Brown took it upon himself to say that he would often kiss her upon the lips. And that shows that they were married and then you know later on Jesus and Mary had a baby and they went to France the baby's name is Sarah and all this other stuff that you'll hear floating around on the internet I'm just going to slowly go through this this is not all in the gospel in the Gnostic gospels but these are considered some of the lost um, the lost gospels or you would find in the book that you might be able to look on a PDF. You might be able to find it on the internet. The lost books of the, um, of the Bible and the forgotten books of Eden. I'm just going to run through a few of these so y'all can see what's going on here before I get to one gentleman and how I can kind of tie that theory in there that um, a lot of people go with far as when we start dealing with the conspiracies. And this is part of it right here. They left these out on purpose to deceive us. This is part of the conspiracy. Like Constantine, a bunch of white folk were together and they had the Bible and they wanted to deceive black people. Other New Agers say that the Catholic Church just kept it out. But I, I specifically speak on the conscious community because everything is a black, white, and we got to watch white people. White people have been lying and they're just deliberately trying to deceive people. This would explain the true religion. The true religion is, it can go back to Kemet and Babylon that everybody with Christ, everybody had God in them. Why do you need a book? And the truth is Jesus taught the truth. Freemasons, Rosicrucians teach the truth. The New Ages are teaching the truth and the church is trying to control you. And those books had to be removed so they can um, control you through the means of religion. These books were, you would often hear Israelites say that these books were removed to hide our true identity. We got different um, conspiracies. We got conspiracies dealing with history. And we'll often hear about people like Anthony West, Timothy Freak, Peter Gandhi, um, Acharya F, and so many other people that don't deal with, you know, they're coming with a conspiratorial view on 
on history. You have a conspiratorial view on when you're dealing with medicine. Clearly, there's some things that went down in this government when we start dealing with medicine and certain things that were done in the African-American community, even if we go to Tuskegee um, to Tuskegee experiment and, you know, the whole syphilis thing that's reported that certain things went down with CIA and mind-altering drugs and MK Ultra. Archaeology is another thing. A lot of people feel you start giving out the ur on the age of ancient Egypt and Kemet and the pyramids and things of that nature that people are lying. The Smithsonian and the government's lying to people because they don't want us to know the true connection with beings from another planet. You'll hear all type of conspiracies. But one of the main conspiracies that you have is dealing with religion and specifically Christianity attempting to rule the world and control people through a false religion and the earlier disciples and Christ himself did not teach a form of Christianity. Now, this is the word that I would like y'all to pay close attention to. We have something that's known as proto-Orthodox Christianity. The term proto-Orthodox Christianity was coined by Professor Bart Ehrman. You know, Bart Ehrman's been around. He went to Princeton, studied under Bruce Metzger. He teaches in New University uh, in North Carolina, I think Chapel Hill, down in North Carolina, Durham, Durham resident. And Bart Ehrman's interesting. He wrote a couple of interesting books, Jesus Forged and so many others as a textual critic. He's been, he's, he's a known atheist. He's um, a, definitely a New Testament scholar in his field. But he, say, uh, he set forth the theory that the Bible cannot really be trusted. But the thing that Bart Ehrman brings out is that when we start dealing with this proto orthodoxy, he is saying that the movement that we would call Gnostic today um, and various groups were on the same level as Orthodox Christianity. Orthodox Christianity didn't really come into full swing until everything was stamped out after the Nicene Council. So he argues that Gnostics, Elaine Pagels, they argue that Gnostics were on the same level. And because they argued that Gnostics were on the same level, whoever won out far as the church fathers and later on Constantine, Eusebius, and other people that were involved in the Nicene Council, they wrote the history the way they they wrote the history, and we have what's known as orthodoxy today. People that believe that theory that Bart Ehrman teached say that Gnosticism was equally as strong, but those that went out just destroyed it, and that was actually the true religion, and the false religion went out. When you watch movies like Hidden Colors um, and it speaks on religion and you, and you listen to things like Professor Williams, when he started dealing with the historical origins of Christianity, he take it back even further. He takes it back to the invasion with Alexander the Great and the Greeks coming on the scene and that being the beginning of a conspiracy to give you a Christ when everybody considered themselves Christ back in the days. So you'll often hear people making statements like Christianity existed before Christ and Egypt, they were, they were the mummified, the, those that were mummified, they were anointed and that's the Christ and everybody was considered a Christ to have everlasting lasting life and things of that nature. And those theories, those fringe theories, like you would see in the Jesus Mysteries written by Timothy Freak and Peter Gandhi, and you would see a Cheria S or DM Murdoch as Christ in Egypt, all of them build off of that theory that the true, true Christianity was destroyed and swept under the rug and their writings were burnt up and other priests like those that were found in that Hamadi just happened to um, hide those things away from the church fathers and the people were out to burn the books and to hide the true esoteric religion, the allegorical truth of Christ consciousness and that these things happened to be found later on through the guy Muhammad Ali. Everywhere you look, those books that are influential in the conscious community such as the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus, on Circle Seven Quran, 
just uh, his parents. They were all about being higher. And this is the foundation. This is basically the foundation of the um, whole spiritual system in the conscious community. They're arguing that it can all be taken, you can all take it back to Kemet. And that's the fountainhead of all religions. And it was the Christ consciousness that was taught from there that people tried to make that was allegorical and people try to turn it around not truly understanding it and giving you what we would call orthodox christianity today i'm gonna stop the video right here but i'm gonna um pick up maybe with a part two getting into the different individuals and what they teach far as this christ consciousness but there's a theory that um elaine pagels and bart ehrman put out there that prior to or proto Orthodox Christianity was on the scene and it was equally as valid as the Christianity that we have today. And a lot of people from the conscious community make a connection and they're teaching black Gnosticism through that or the black Gnostic movement and they're tying it back to Kemet. Um, so I just wanted to show that to y'all right now. If y'all like what you heard, um, subscribe. I appreciate y'all watching. Thanks for checking me out.